Hi folks, and welcome to a new interview on the Skeptical Leftist Podcast. I have another great interview for you this time around, but first I have a couple things to say. Uh, first, I guess, thanks to all of you who uh, stayed on as patrons, despite the fact that I haven't published anything in a few weeks. It's been a crazy month uh, between packing, moving, and working extra shifts, and I just really appreciate everyone who stuck with me. Uh, even if you are just subscribed on the podcast app of your choice or on YouTube, uh, if you're just waiting patiently for another episode, I really appreciate that. If you are a person who's subscribed on uh, like a podcast app, then maybe head over to YouTube, uh, look for the Skeptical Leftist Podcast. I do some stuff over there on YouTube that doesn't make it all the way over to the podcast app, including like the live stream versions of uh, Red Reviews episodes and, po and interviews. Uh, plus, I'm actually looking forward to uh, potentially making it up to a thousand subs before the end of this year. That would be something that I would really like to do. I'm changing a few of the things that I'm doing, like titles and thumbnails. It's not all on YouTube. It's not all just going to be like interview or episode number, whatever. Uh, so hopefully I can get that going. I have a pretty small audience and I could say with pretty close to certainty that most of you are very cool people. And if you, I would love to build community. Uh, so check out the link in the show notes for the discord community and maybe we can, uh, develop something there and chat, uh, on discord. Before I get right into the interview, I have a couple things to say. Uh, I talked to Chris Birkenbein. Um, he does the podcast, a dash of science. And it was a good chat. We talked about cryptocurrency. And while I don't think I articulated my objections to uh, crypto quite as well as I could have, it was still a, a good chat. If you check out uh, podcast like a podcast like uh, Tech Won't Save Us or a YouTube channel Folding Ideas, uh, Dan Olson's channel, there are quite a few good videos. There's quite a bit of good content out there criticizing uh, NFTs, a metaverse, crypto coins, uh, these crypto banks and, and all these various things that go along with the culture of cryptocurrency and the web 3.0. Um, yeah, so make sure to check all that out. I'm not entirely convinced that this blockchain or like web 3.0 is actually like a, a good way to go with anything. But uh, I, I still wanted to go into this conversation with Chris, kind of just having a conversation about it. You might note that Chris um, isn't a leftist or per, or in spite of maybe have, having some progressive ideas or leftish ideas, he considers himself a centrist. Uh, and you know, uh, if you watch my channel for very long, that how I feel about centrists generally. Um, but that this discussion didn't really get into politics so much. It was more about just chatting about cryptocurrency. Uh, I think that if we were to get into politics, me and Chris would disagree quite a bit, but we might also agree on some things. Uh, I think he's a pretty good guy, and uh, though I don't know him super well, we've fo kind of followed each other over the years for uh, over various, various platforms. Um, if you want to check out Chris's content, uh, the podcast, A Dash of Science, and uh, his Twitch stream, or his Twitch channel, where he I guess he plays video games, some... Uh, will be those links will be in the show notes as well as the links to uh, the uh, website for a dash of science podcast uh, i will also put in the links some of the episodes of tech won't save us that are very good critiques of uh, various crypto cultural things as well as uh, uh two of dan olson's videos or folding ideas videos uh, on the metaverse and nfts and then on top of that i also have a video where it's just a podcast episode from 2018 or something when I was interviewing somebody on uh, Bitcoin and yeah I thought that was something that I would include in the show notes as well um, if you want to check out that from back from when I did brainstorm so now on to the like pitch so thank you to all my patrons but an extra special thank you to Damien uh, for increasing uh, his pledge while despite the fact that I haven't been producing content uh, patrons make it possible for me to do this show and as you know, me and my family recently moved and our rent is like $700 a month more than it was before. So things are pretty tight. I've had to cut some corners. Uh, but uh, yeah, your your support helps uh, me to use the bright programs, the editing programs, the, uh, the streaming programs, various things that uh, right now, because I don't have the time to do the technical learning that I normally would, uh, yeah. 
I've, I'm relying on these tools that cost money and, uh, I, your, your support actually makes that possible. Uh, so you can support me at $1 per month or $1.50 for Canadians. Um, if you cannot support me with money, then please hit the like button on, uh, YouTube or go and write a review on the podcast app of your choice or on Podchaser. Uh, always looking for more ratings and reviews. It looks like my show is down at a four on Spotify. So, or 4.4, 4, I think it says. So, uh, come and give me some more five star reviews so that I can get that back up. Uh, that'd be fantastic. Um, yeah, check out all those links in the show notes. And you can make sure to subscribe on YouTube or uh, the podcast app of your choice so that you get episodes, new episodes all the time. You can feel free to contact me by messaging on social media. Uh, leave me a comment on YouTube. Uh, use my contact form on the website, uh, skepticalleftist.com. And you can email me at mindofaskepticalleftist at gmail.com. I think that's everything. Uh, so on to the interview. <laughs> All right. Hi, and welcome to the Skeptical Leftist Podcast. Uh, my name is Corey. I'm your host. And today I'm joined by Chris from the A Dash of Science Podcast. Thanks for joining me. Yeah, absolutely. How are you doing today? I am, I guess I'm, I'd say I'm good. I'm having a good day. <laughs> <laughs> so far, so good. <laughs> they say alive is good, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's, it's a good start anyway. How about yourself? Uh, doing pretty good. I uh, had a lot of changes going on uh, on my side that I've been trying to schedule around, but I think everything's kind of s- settled out, so doing good. Yeah, we've got a few a few things going on around the house these days too, so it's uh, trying to make sure that everything gets done, but also producing a podcast. <laughs> yep, yep. I know that. I know that feel. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Um, so I guess uh, bring up a couple things here so that we can we know what we're talking about. Sure. So, uh, I guess <laughs> one of the questions that I often ask is like, how do you identify politically? So I, I actually mm-hmm. incorporated that into my guest questions on Calendly now. And you said that you actively don't. Correct. So, so let's go through <laughs> that. How do you, how do you avoid identifying politically? Well, first of all, I will say that just because I don't identify politically doesn't mean that other people don't identify me politically. Uh, so oh, that yeah. happens a lot. Yeah, that, um, that's a thing. <laughs> I think like a lot of people, I started out kind of more democratic when I was younger. Uh, and I became, I don't want to say Republican, but more conservative as I got older, at least as regards to like fiscal policies, foreign stuff, you know, when it came to social stuff, I always was pretty, I've, I've maintained pretty liberal in that regard. Okay. Uh, so what happened was essentially as I've gotten older and I'm looking at, you know, where my home should be, uh, I started realizing that I don't really have a home. And in fact, I don't think most people have a home. I think most people adapt to basically parrot whatever, you know, the left or the right side are saying. I think if you talk to people before they get actually ingrained in in politics, you'll find that most people's ideas tend to be individual for each, you know, individual topic that you're talking about. But when you morph into a political party, you kind of have to like take on almost their entire platform in order to uh, succeed in a, in a political way, right? Um, and I, I personally believe that the left and the right are getting further left and right as we go through time, you know, so I started identifying myself as, as, you know, uh, kind of a centrist, right. Mm-hmm. Uh, until I got online and, and started seeing <laughs> what other people are also identifying that way. Wait, all <laughs> the like, centrists you know, suck. <laughs> right? I'm like, huh, some of them seem kind of racist. I don't think I'll be associated with these people, yeah. you know, and, and then I was reading about libertarianism and on paper, libertarian. It, it looks amazing. And then I started talking with a lot of people who also identify that way. And I found that there really isn't a libertarian. Um, everybody <laughs> seems to be their own version of libertarian. And some of them share some insights with me and some of them don't. But they're they're more, from an outside perspective, seem to be interested in arguing with each other about what it means to be libertarian than actually doing anything. And because of how our political system works, which is not officially, but essentially a two-party system, yeah. it makes it incredibly difficult uh, to not be one of those two parties. So when it comes to that, I, I don't, you know, uh, I say okay. that Democrats call me Republican and Republicans call me Democrat. And that's kind of where I like to be. Okay. So 
Um, I mean, some people think I just like to argue, but that's not the case. I promise. <laughs> Democrats, Democrats to, will call anybody who criticizes the Democratic Party. At, they'll call them right wingers, whether we are or not. Absolutely. So absolutely. <laughs> so I, I, I don't really take a lot of stock in what they say. But, yep. <laughs> but I, I tell them I am definitely more right than you are, and we can just agree to that. <laughs> I always have to point out, like, no, I absolutely am. I'm so much farther left than you that you suck oh, yeah. to me. Like, <laughs> <laughs> I'm so far left that you think I'm right. <laughs> yeah, like what the? It's because they don't actually know anything. <laughs> no, I mean, that's, I've found that to be the case with most people on most topics. I'm yeah, not going to lie. You know, even me, true. I find that I don't know what I think I know on a lot of topics. Yeah, so. that's fair. Yeah. It's good to maintain that uh, at least some level of humility and understand that, hey, I could be definitely wrong about things. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, like obviously I, I identify I'm an anarcho-communist. So mm -hmm. uh, pretty far left. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I don't identify with any of the parties by any, at any point. Sure. I, uh, I suppose I could endorse a Green Party if – Mm -hmm. They didn't seem so reactionary sometimes, right. <laughs> but uh, yeah. And obviously, well, no, I think that's a good word that defines most people these days is reactionary. Mm -hmm. uh, I feel like everybody is just hating as a reaction or what's even worse is if they're, you know, their polar opposite political party is for something, then obviously they have to be against it. And there's no further discussion right, right. or analysis than that. So, yeah, it's like, uh, like I, I dislike. Uh, the quote unquote libertarians, right? Because uh, they're pro capital. They're, mm -hmm. they're very pro capitalism. They just want total deregulation in general, right? Right. Um, uh, but I, I have to admit that they're often quite right about the state and the government. Sure. <laughs> so <Nope. laughs> it's important to like recognize where your ideological opponents yeah. are correct and, where and they aren't. And just being able to recognize what looks great on paper and what just doesn't work like it, like it says it does when you involve human beings, yeah, <laughs> right? Yeah. Human beings are a crazy factor to throw into any system, whether it's political or engineering or whatever, right? Like it's, right. it's almost uh, something that you can't rely on going according to plan in any way, shape or form. It's funny. Uh, like you think of like engineering, <laughs> when I, because I've always worked in the field, I've never been like mm -hmm. an engineer. But uh, it's the uh, the reputation of engineers when you work in the field is mm -hmm. not very good usually. <laughs> sure, <laughs> it's, it's no, absolutely. It's like their math. Like it's always like like that exact thing. Like what you're saying works in on paper, but when you get out into the field, when you're working with uh, actual weather and actual fluid dynamics and actual like. Uh, various factors that we can't control, then it all goes out the window. Right. No, you're hundred percent. And it's kind of interesting because I kind of straddle a couple of different areas because academically I'm a trained physicist. So I'm in the sciences and I've done research, Right. Uh, but for the last decade I've worked as an engineer. So I know that area, but I work like very intimately with, you know, um, operators and technicians who also have their own thing. And the one thing that I've noticed is every group of people very much talks negatively about the other groups of people and how they just <laughs> they're stuck in their in their you know paradigm and they and they can't like see outside of it but in reality you need all of them to be that way in order to come up with functioning things yeah so it's quite interesting yeah yeah if yeah uh, because uh, <laughs> not to speak ill of the people i work with but <laughs> they don't know the math right mm -hmm. <laughs> so <laughs> so if if we didn't have engineers figuring some of this stuff out we sure. would be lost. And without us doing the actual job and adapting on the fly, the engineering wouldn't have it. anything, right? Yeah, so. it, it does not work without yeah. the math. It just doesn't. <laughs> but you need people to kind of fudge it around when it's actually in its environment to get the optimal, you know, yeah. use cases. So, yeah. Yeah, for you sure. Know, it's, it's a fun thing. It's always interesting to talk to somebody else who's just kind of aware of how that works, you know. <laughs> But, uh, but I mean, the same thing comes down to it. Like we we're saying you design a system in engineering and then you have people that are like, okay, now humans are going to interact with this. So we have to, you know, right. fail it. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, it, it makes me think of like, uh, I, uh, we have a building at work where, mm -hmm. um, so we deal with a lot of fluids and we have big pumps that pump it down into a disposal well. And, uh, this one building, I like pumps eventually leak when you, when they wear out, mm -hmm. but this building wasn't designed with a 
receptacle or a sump for this fluid to go into when the pump starts to leak in various ways. So, so you just have a floor that eventually gets soaking wet. <laughs> You're constantly mopping and squeegeeing it. And oh wow! Yeah, it's pretty, uh, pretty, uh, pretty bad engineering. <laughs> <laughs> Once you get into like the actual physical doing of the job. Oh yeah, I bet. Well, somebody somewhere is like, well, this is the maintenance schedule. And as long as everybody's, you know, replacing their skills and doing their stuff, and yep. there shouldn't ever be a problem, yeah, right? Exactly. Nothing else will ever happen. <laughs> yeah. And actually like even us guys in the field, we're often like, yeah, I mean, if we could do the maintenance schedule, that'd be great. And if we had, mm -hmm. you know, we could replace parts as soon as they start to have an issue, that's great. But then we also have come into like conflict with budgetary constraints oh, yeah. and like uh, management that decides, oh, well, we're just not going to use that pump for a couple months. <laughs> <laughs> because that's the easiest solution financially for them, right? Yeah, so. Again, it's real world scenario versus on paper, right? Yeah. This is how it should work and this is how it's going to work. Yeah, yeah <laughs> that's right. Uh, so I guess uh, kind of moving on a little bit, uh, you've got a podcast, A Dash of Science. Uh, yeah. What do you do on that podcast? Uh, so for warning, first of all, I have had a bit of a hiatus. Uh, I am getting back to it. Um, I, I've been doing the podcast for several years. And essentially, my primary goal is just to take concepts that people maybe don't necessarily understand, whether it's engineering, science, whatever. Uh, and I try and break that down to kind of a level that everybody can talk to. And I get uh, academia, uh, professionals in industry or just other people that are just experts in a particular uh, area to come in and help me talk about it because I'm not an expert in everything. I, I do really well at, at understanding things and breaking it down, uh, but you know nobody can know everything. So I, I try to bring other people who can also kind of talk at a level that's enjoyable and understandable for everybody. So, I mean, we've done topics like, you know, evolution uh, to, I've done some minor stuff on uh, blockchain technology in general, very minor because it's a very complex topic. Right. Uh, but yeah, just across the board. I mean, there's a couple of ones I've done on like historical figures like Tesla, you know, just kind of biographies of life. So kind of the whole gambit of anything that would be STEM related, basically. Nice. Uh, I uh, actually thinking about it, I think you're probably the first person I've had on, even though it's a, the skeptical leftist, you're mm -hmm. probably the first person I've had on who's like an actual science communicator at mm -hmm. talking about some that, that that talks about science like i had i think uh uh jeremiah traeger uh, mm -hmm. uh on uh, like years ago uh like two years ago uh but we talked about the atheist community mm -hmm. <laughs> so it yeah. wasn't about science it wasn't about like sure yeah but, which is you know its own whole thing there's i'm sure i'll have to yeah. go back and listen to that because uh that's another topic that sometimes so i avoid that topic on my podcast Good call. uh very very <laughs> specifically there's a couple of things you know i don't talk about religion and i i will not entertain flat earthers uh yeah, but, and then anti-vaxxers on a general level the covid stuff was something very specific and unique and important that we got into a little bit but right. in general the whole the old school arguments about, you know, uh, autism and vaccines. I, I don't entertain those conversations right, right. anymore. Well, and, and honestly, like a lot of the COVID vaccine denial stuff has come up, uh, like it comes along with the same level of honesty and mm -hmm. thinking. And like, it's, it's much the same, like it's the same group of people in many ways. <laughs> it, it's definitely the same group of people that hold on to it. But I found that there was a, a quite a large number of people who are just, for lack of a better word, I don't say it as a as a diss, but uneducated in in the in the areas that they need to to understand. Mm -hmm. You know, so if you have people claiming and running around, oh, this changes your DNA, you have no foundation to think it doesn't, right? So I've I found a lot of that stuff. So at that level is what I would address it at. But you're right, there are people who are hanging on to it past being presented the facts, and those right. are absolutely the same people. Yeah, I uh, I guess maybe because I already had like the I was already. Like, I'm not a scientist, but I had mm -hmm. like some sort of background. I've been in the skeptical community, was in the skeptical community for like 10 years. So, mm -hmm. so I had more knowledge about vaccines and how they work than uh, I guess the average person does. So yeah, when I heard like this guy, who's like the New York times science correspondent saying, well, I'd take the vaccine. Well, then I'm like, okay, good enough for me. <laughs> <laughs> right. And <laughs> And what's interesting is that's actually how most people work, but the problem comes into is what their, 
I guess, their level of effort is in ensuring those people that they trust are actually trustworthy in those areas that there. they're talking to. You know what I mean? Yeah. And I've, I've made this conversation and actually a lot of left-leaning people get really angry with me for saying this, but I, I say, you know, you do the same thing when it comes to science topics that people on the right do. The difference is, is you're accidentally correct. Yeah. Because you're, you just happen to follow the people who do know what they're talking about in, in these areas, right? But like, and it's not, it's not a put down. You, you don't have the background necessarily to always go in depth on these things and understand them at a scientific level. And there's nothing wrong with that, you know, but you do have to be able to figure out who you can trust and who you can't in those areas. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, it's not, it's not easy to be just a person that's thrust into a situation and like, well, there's these people saying that thing and these people saying that thing. And well, how do I even know? Right, exactly. But so that's why I personally advocate that everybody learns how to read an actual research paper. Mm. It's daunting at first, but it is so well worth it uh, because the the amount of uh, disagreement that you will find in just a basic news article covering a research oh, yeah. paper between what they've written and when you actually go and read it is just phenomenal. You you are left wondering if they read the same paper that you did. <laughs> oftentimes, <laughs> I recently I recently just experienced that actually. Like there was a. Uh, an article from a local news uh, news outlet, I think it was Global or CTV, and they were talking about, uh, oh, what the hell was it? It was something about, uh, oh, use of um, like uh, bodybuilding supplements linked mm -hmm. to, uh, is linked to poor body image, mm -hmm. self body image. And, uh, but the way that they worded it in the article was as though, taking the supplements caused the poor body image issues. Right. And as I, opposed to the other way around. Yeah, and I, I looked at the I looked at the paper and I said, like, that's absolutely not what it says. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then you're just sitting there just like your brain's blowing up and, and it comes up in conversations and you're just like, no, just like read the paper. Yeah, and just, people just have this <laughs> <laughs> this thing about not wanting to read science. And I get it. Science is daunting and it looks hard if you haven't been educated in it properly. And unfortunately, uh, in the United States, we do a very poor job, I personally think, in educating science and math to people. Yeah, that that's fair. I mean, Canada's not much different. <laughs> <laughs> we we slightly fund our education a little bit better than the US, right. but not by a ton. <laughs> But what do you do? You know, that's beyond my ability to fix. So now I'm a science communicator and I hope that uh, I help at least some people uh, get a little better grasp on some of the ideas that we talk about. So. Yeah, hopefully. Um, well, I guess the topic of the day, uh, the, the reason <laughs> you came on uh, is, uh, or I guess, yeah, crypto, right? Yeah, you're absolutely. Gonna, you're going to try and convince me that it's not a con. Yes. <laughs> I am. <laughs> All right. And I think I think that I can do it to some extent, uh, but given some of your leanings and ideas potentially about how monetary systems in general work, uh, I might not. But if I can at least convince you that it is the same as or better than any other monetary system, I'll be I'll be okay with that. I'll call that a victory. <laughs> I, there is definitely room for that. <laughs> All right. <laughs> I do want to say uh, I am I am not a crypto expert. Okay. Um, I don't work in the industry. I don't represent any company or assets. This is just me through my own experiences, what I've learned. Certainly don't, you know, listen to me and then run off and invest all of your money into some <laughs> cryptocurrency because while I maintain cryptocurrency is not a scam, there are scammers out there. Right. Absolutely. Clearly, right. There, so, I mean, yeah. you've got, uh, what's his name who, uh, was basically doing a Ponzi scheme, SBF. S oh yeah, <laughs> from FT uh, from FTX, yeah, yeah, uh, and <laughs> yeah. I mean, <laughs> you this is this is where crypto is. For the last year, it's been a horrible year, and the level of distrust and distaste in the general population for cryptocurrency is rightly very bad because mm -hmm. we've had a lot of bad things happen in this past year with a lot of bad publicity. But remember that those are people utilizing a thing to scam people. It's no different than any other thing of monetary value, whether it's stocks or money or whatever else, right? Like you, you have those same stories in every aspect of life where some form of value is transferred. So I, uh, you, I just, uh, um, I wonder like, uh, cause is there regulations 
like I'm not a big state guy, but in this case, sure. it seems like without the state doing some regulation, uh, you're always going to have like these kind of con artists taking the lead on this stuff. Yes, yes, absolutely. And that is what the legitimate cryptocurrency or the crypto industry has been asking for in the United States for years mm. because there's it doesn't fall into the current regulations. And you have, I, I hate to say it, but you have older people who don't necessarily understand things saying, oh, no, just come into the SEC and register. But when they do, they say, okay, well, how do we register this? And the SEC goes, well, we can't tell you that, <laughs> right? And then they turn around and then they sue people for breaking laws that don't exist. Like, this is this Very is strange. the real world we're living in right now. Yeah. And so at this point, they're even like, we don't even care how strict you are. Just give us something to follow, Right. right? You know, and there there are legitimate actors in this space that are reporting bad actors to the government. And the government, instead of doing anything about them, is going after the legitimate actors mm. time after time. And there's some, you know, I'm not a very big conspiracy theory person, but there's some things that get to a certain level where you're like, I really don't see how this is not that. <laughs> like, I'm trying, <laughs> trying to keep an open mind. I'm trying not to whatever, but, you know, uh, so that's really where it comes down to. But I figure the best place to start to try and convince you of this is to really just talk about some fundamentals between sure. blockchain and cryptocurrency. I don't know how much you know coming into this, but I'm just going to start at low level. People know nothing. Yep. Uh, and first of all, that's understanding that blockchain and cryptocurrency are not synonymous. They are not the same thing. Cryptocurrency is one aspect of how blockchain can be utilized right, amongst right. many, right? So the primary example for that is obviously Bitcoin. Bitcoin was the first cryptocurrency. It was developed specifically as a cryptocurrency. Uh, it still gets utilized as just a, a storage of wealth mm -hmm. and potentially investment, but its primary point is to be a, a cryptocurrency and it was built to basically exist in exactly the state we're in right now with the financial system which is why all of the stuff that's going on in the in the financial system and crypto space over the last year we're seeing with these bank failures this last couple of weeks bitcoin is 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 rising in value suddenly oh, okay uh, and that's because everybody that's in this space is recognizing this is exactly why this was developed to to protect us from these issues right so not not all uh, crypto coins have the same uh, security as, say, Bitcoin, right? Correct. Yeah. There's so when you get into your blockchain, a blockchain is just a ledger system, right? And it was actually theorized way back in like 1982. Uh, this kind of third party uh, triple entry system, for lack of a better word to call it, uh, as a way to protect against the errors that kind of come in. I don't know how much you know about accounting, but so you have basically single entry, which very simplified, you know, you've got a king, he controls all the money, you make transaction, the king's treasurer records it in the ledger book, whatever that book says is law, right. you have one entry, one time coming in, there's no disagreement with it, no matter what, obviously, we can very, see, very much see how that's prone to both errors, <laughs> uh, accidental and deliberate, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, then about the 1400s, we kind of developed this double entry system, which was essentially any time you mark down a change in your ledger, there is another change somewhere else that balances it, right? So I purchased something for $100 here, so I'm minus $100. Right. Somewhere else, there's an asset of $100 value that's also being entered. So there's two values. So it's much more secure. Anytime they don't uh, balance out, you know there's a problem. But at the end of the day, you still have two ledgers. It's still prone to mistake, maybe not as much, and it's you know still prone to malicious use. Mm -hmm. And so now we come into where blockchain comes in, and that's this, what they call kind of a, some people call it like a permissionless single entry. I like to call it a, 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 a triple entry ledger. Okay. So whenever the transaction happens, you have a copy of it. The person you transacted has a copy of it. And a third copy is permanently published in public, transparent, unchangeable forever. Okay. So basically, that's the power behind what blockchain is, right? Okay. So it's important because of a few things. First of all, you now have a truly neutral financial system, right? So in the US, we have basically the central bank system, and it's pretty similar across most countries. Uh, I think we got central bank around early 1900s right. and these banks can essentially print endless money, which it distributes directly to bankers, bureaucrats, big businesses, right? So they get all of this money. 
And then they can immediately spend it in the market as is before the market has had a time to basically react to this increased supply of money. Hmm. So they start spending, the market reacts. And by the time that money gets down to people like you and me, the market has drastically increased in price. And so that's, you know, inflation, right? Whenever you increase the supply of money, you're going to cause inflation. That's very basic economics. Uh, yeah, I mean, so sort of, right? Like it's actually a little bit more complicated. Than there's, that. <laughs> there's other things that come into it, right? I'm not saying that it's not complicated. I'm just saying at its core, when you increase the supply of money and you're not taking it out, you're decreasing the value of money. Yeah. That's, that's what I'm trying yeah, to say. Yeah, yeah. Don't get me wrong. It's a very complex system. There's a million <laughs> other things that go into that, but that is definitely a driver. And we see that, especially in the US where they printed all this money out for people for freezies out of nowhere. Uh, to help with the pandemic and look where we're at right now. Is that the only cause to it? Absolutely not. But it did not help. Right. So, right. so that's what you have. Uh, and then on top of that, you have the banking systems to get that. They, they control every aspect. Who can get an account? Who can get a credit card? Which is not impossible, but it's about as hard as it can be without being impossible to interact in a first world country today without a banking account. Yeah. yeah. And right. uh, banks aren't part of the government. They are third party private companies, then they yeah. completely control every aspect of your money. And they make money on storing, transmitting, lending every aspect of your money, right? To the effect where like, we don't know, actually, because sometimes they'll use the same money over and over again for different uh -huh. investments. So then we don't even know how much money truly exists digitally. Exactly. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And then we have that based on this, what we call the fractional reserve system, where they're only required to keep a small percentage of their total funds on hand at any given time, which right. makes them susceptible to bank runs, which is exactly what's going on this last couple of weeks. Uh, and then you combine that kind of with our current economic system where banks in general, they make uh, long-term investments on certain assets. Uh, and because of inflation, where our economy is right now, most of those assets are worth less than they bought them for. Mm -hmm. So if you ever are a bank and you are in a position where you have to sell your assets at a loss, you're a private company or not a private company, you're a publicly traded company usually. Uh, and that diminishes trust in you and your stock prices decrease. And when the stock dips by 60%, people get scared and they rush to take their money out and their money isn't there. Bam. That is every failure that has happened in the last three weeks, except <laughs> right. for Signature, which I'll talk about <laughs> later. <laughs> but so with cryptocurrencies, you don't get that. Everybody has their own storage. Now you can store it on a, on a uh, marketplace if you choose, but really the idea behind cryptocurrency is self storage, right? Your own hardware. That you yeah. But this has also been presented uh, in some ways as like a flaw too, right? Because self storage is subject to like, because everything's uh, the secure, like a lot of people have had their wallets stolen or uh, sure. they forget their password and then they lose whatever or money they had within their storage. Like, like that was one of the criticisms that I saw a sure. lot of. But that's not a flaw of the system. That's a flaw of people not accurate, like taking care of their issues. You have that same problem if you're keeping cash in your safe. You have that same problem if you're doing anything. You know, people can do social phishing attacks to get access to your passwords and hack your banking accounts. The difference is, though, is if you lose your, let's say you have a hard wallet and you lose that. Hmm. As long as you maintain your uh, passwords, which are basically a set of 10 words, you can restore that on any device anywhere because your coinage isn't stored physically on a hard drive. All you are storing right, is right. the keys that says you own it, right? The, the coins themselves are just out there. And you just basically have the keys that says those are yours and you can restore those at any time. So if you are being smart about it <laughs> and doing proper uh, due diligence, that doesn't happen. It's the same stuff. Protect yourself from from phishing attacks. One, uh, don't put your keywords anywhere where somebody can take them. Right. Yeah. Right. I mean, that's really what it comes down to. There are other issues. There's always stuff that happens, but that level of stuff happens no matter what currency you're using. It's just a little bit different in how it comes out. You can always lose it to other people. Um, I mean, hell, like how many how many people throw away money every day on accident? You know what I oh, mean? Yeah, and yeah. it's just whatever. But when you when you get it, there's no bar to who can open an account. The software, if you want to be a miner, is open source. And if you want to get a wallet, sure, you can pay for really fancy stuff, but you don't have to. You can get free open source stuff and install it on a cheap hard drive if you wanted to. Uh, so there's no, there's no barring anybody 
from being able to transact with any cryptocurrency. There is a barrier to transferring your fiat currency to crypto, and that barrier is the banking system and governments. But other than that, it's a neutral financial system. So that's the biggest, okay. uh, I want to say the biggest, that's the first uh, benefit to a cryptocurrency. Okay. Um, the second one is decentralization, which kind of leads a little bit into that. So whenever you put your money in any form of anything, it's located in one place. One person has control over it, whether it's in a safe in your home and it's you, which would be sort of similar to cryptocurrency, uh, or it's in a bank somewhere in which that bank essentially owns it. There's If they lose it, you can't get it back. If they tell you, like there are banks in the world that have money that are refusing to allow people to withdraw their own money. Right, they yeah, were, yeah, like, you've heard of that. Like even in the 2008 uh, stuff that was going on in the sure. U- US, like you heard of people trying to get money and they couldn't get it. And it, and it wasn't because of bank run. It was just because of whatever else is going on. Like even a co- within this last year in other countries, I think I can't remember what country it was. Somebody basically robbed a bank to get their own money out of the bank. <laughs> that's it because <laughs> right. they needed their money. Yeah. Right. So that's that's a problem. So when you have decentralization, essentially the controlling factor of Bitcoin or other cryptocurrencies uh, that work like this is called consensus across a network of literally like 50, 100,000 different nodes. Okay. So the only way you can get control of that is if you own 51% of the nodes. And that doesn't sound like it would be hard, but just to kind of put it out there, the largest mining facility in the world in China operates at 6% of the nodes. Okay. And it costs them over a million dollars a month in power to run it. Yeah, that's But they're generating several millions of dollars in profit just from mining. So it's kind of a twofold uh, block, right? One, it's extremely hard and extremely expensive to do it. But also you, it's really lucrative to just be a legal miner and just do it how it's supposed to, to to operate in this consensus model. Why spend all this extra money for this one-time thing when you can operate legally in the framework and make millions of dollars a month, right? So that's kind of where the protection comes from. So it's decentralization, your money's out there. Nobody can stop you from transacting it in any way that you want, period, ever. It's between you and whoever you're making a transaction with, and that's it. Uh, The next point is transparency, which is different than anonymity. So who owns a wallet? Technically, you're anonymous, though. I mean, there are ways that people can, you know, analyze what you're doing and figure it out, just like with anything. But in general, all you get is a wallet ID that's not assigned to a human being. Okay. But you can see at any point throughout the entire history of a cryptocurrency who has spent what where. Right. Where yeah. did money go? Yeah. Right. Yeah, so it's imagine like a ledger or whatever of every single exactly. transaction, right? Yeah. And so imagine if the government were utilizing something like this for taxes, right? <laughs> There'd be no more of this, oh, we don't know where that three hundred million dollars went. Uh, right. You could see exactly you might not know exactly who the person controlling it is or what they paid for, but you know that three hundred million dollars went from this wallet to that wallet on this date. And you can also tra- you know, follow it from that wallet and on and on and on. So I mean, there would be no more, I don't know what my taxes go for. Don't get me wrong, no government is ever going to willingly go to the system. But from a yeah. from a citizen's perspective, <laughs> right? Uh, <laughs> it's a much better system. And then lastly, it's immutability. It is about as impossible to hack this system as it could ever be to hack a system. Yes, you can do it, but it's kind of like a brute force attack, right? At this point with our current hashing and crypto uh, stuff for protecting passwords, if you're going to brute force a good password, it's going to take a couple hundred years. So is it possible? Yes. Is it feasible? Not really. Yeah, see, I'm I'm a little confused here because... I, I understand like that people have had their wallets stolen. So mm-hmm. how did that happen if hacking is impossible? So it's not that hacking is impossible. Or, it's hacking of the ledger is, is near okay, impossible, okay. right? So what happens is when you get a new project, right? A new, uh, basically crypto comes out. Uh, and say it's a layer two, which I can get into later if we want to, but essentially they're just a new software and they put stuff out there and people voluntarily use it knowing that it's new. It's going to have bugs like any pieces of software, right? So people find exploits. Sometimes it's people saying, Hey, I found this exploit. Here's your money back, which legitimately happens in cryptocurrency. People do this, you know, if you want to call it white hat hacker or whatever, and they say, fix your shit. (laughs) <laughs> you know, right, right. Uh, this, and so that happens and, and then they fix it. Uh, of course, other cases, it's not so much and somebody makes off with millions of dollars 
And yeah, that sucks. But if you don't want that to happen, don't invest in a new technology. I mean, <laughs> unfortunately, I hate to be like rude about it, but you need to know the risks of what you're doing. You have to. So, and so I guess I'm still, I'm still like, uh, wondering like, uh, how is, how, cause so a lot of this stuff, it seems a lot like, uh, the pump and dump type of stock, uh, scams. Um, mm -hmm. so how do you avoid that kind of situation? So first of all, one, like we were talking about earlier, you do have to have some regulation that says this is okay. And this is mm -hmm. not, there is like, I hate to say that the government entity should be able to hold my hand. Uh, <laughs> but unfortunately the reality is there is a little bit, people do things without understanding. So there's some of that, at least to hold the people accountable, like we do other industries, right? Like we have some regulations that come with stock. So when something like Enron happens, right? People lose money, but there's also ramifications to the people who took that money and they do their best to make people whole to with whatever, even with FTX, they mm -hmm. came in, they filed a legitimate bankruptcy. They've got the dude that handled Enron uh, is handling uh, FTX is, and they're doing their best to sell assets and make their customers whole. So okay. um, it's had a lot of ramifications beyond that, obviously, but still, I mean, that's the benefit of being in a country that has those regulations. Um, the other aspect of it is just doing your due diligence. When you look at something like Bitcoin, Bitcoin has been around since 2009 and the blockchain has been uh, working essentially flawless for that entire time. Now you have, so Bitcoin would be what's called a layer one. If you think of layer one technology, think of it like a city, someone's developed a new city, okay. right? And a layer two, you can think some private companies come in and they've built their own transportation system within that city. It helps people get around faster. Maybe it improves privacy, uh, you know, just kind of stuff like that. It's like modification. So it sits on top of it. Okay. So the first thing is you have to understand what you're investing in and what it does. Does it okay. have a real use, right? So for some place like Ripple, which I'm personally a fan of, it's not necessarily decentralized, but it's a very, very much a utility coin. It has a specific purpose that helps essentially transfer money between like legitimate, you know, traditional banks. Uh, and so it has a purpose and it has a value and they're doing something with it. So I am confident in looking at what's going around and I'm seeing all of these major banks throughout the entire world are adapting it, are adapting right. the Ripple Network and utilizing it. So that to me, like if all of these big banks are willing to put that sort of trust into that, then maybe I can too. Okay. You know, so you just, you've really got to understand what they're doing. And what you'll see is over the last, before what we call the crypto winter happened, uh, there was just companies coming out left and right because one, there was no regulation. Two, there was a crap ton of money to be made. Right. So it was a very, you know, wild, wild west situation. And a lot of people legitimately came out with honest intent and good ideas, but they developed a solution where nobody was asking for one. <laughs> and so they're just kind of sitting there like, hey, look at this cool thing we could do. And everybody's like, yeah, that's a really cool thing that we can do. Right. And so you'll see it in like uh, like NFTs and like with gaming and stuff. Uh, so there's games that utilize NFTs, but those games only exist to support that NFT uh, technology. Right. Okay. It's not NFT supporting right. a yeah. game. Yeah. And so you, you find a lot of stuff like that where people are just maybe a little ahead of their time or maybe not quite solving problems that people actually have yet. And so whenever you have that in a booming market, I mean, whether it's crypto or it was the dot com era or whatever, the housing market, whatever it is, like when you have a big boom bubble, when stuff gets hard, a lot of them are going to fail. And that's not even counting anybody that's just not being honest or trying to screw people over. Right. So you, you like any investment, don't invest something you can't afford to, to lose and educate yourself on what you're investing in. I mean, that's really what it comes down to. I'm I'm struck by a similarity between this, between crypto and our conversation about engineering and mm -hmm. like how this seems to be okay on paper, but as soon as you get people involved, you start having all kinds of complications and like, uh, then you get scams and, and failures mm -hmm. and, and whatnot. And so I guess, how, how can a guy like me trust crypto <laughs> when... I've, when, uh, when like people are involved. <laughs> sure. Well, what it comes down to is being honest with yourself on what you're doing with crypto. Most people for crypto, it's FOMO, fear of missing out. They're mm. seeing people walk away after a couple of weeks with, you know, 100 X increase in, in profit. 
right? When the crypto boom was happening, right. their only intent to getting into crypto was because they wanted to make quick money. Right. If you're trying to make quick money, I don't care what you're putting it in. You're probably at high risk of losing your money. So if you're going to do that, just be honest with yourself and that's what you're doing and just take your hits when they come. Otherwise, if you have a genuine thing you're trying to solve, like let's take Bitcoin. Bitcoin was developed to be a a currency that wasn't controlled by any particular government or entity right. that would be safe from uh, from inflation over time. Don't get me wrong. It's still highly volatile. We're not there yet as being a uh, uh, basically anything but a storage of wealth. But when you look at it, there, I don't know how right now you would kill crypto it, or, or Bitcoin unless legitimately every country on earth just was like, made it illegal to own it and started like cracking down on it with the death penalty. And even then it would still be out there right in the black market. <laughs> right. But like, it's just, it's gotten big enough now to where it's not quite to the level where it, it's ready to be like the full on alternative, but it's stable okay. as long as you stay in there long enough. Right. It's not stable in that the value is going to stay the, the same from one month to the next, but it's stable and it's not going to go to zero. Like that's my honest belief and it will eventually rise Okay. Uh, because the way that Bitcoin specifically works is there's, I think, 21 million Bitcoin, period. There will never be any more. Right. Yeah. I think I remember here. So it's, right. it's like, uh, it's like a, like you say, like a fixed number of stocks, shares in a, mm-hmm. co- in a company or whatever. Exactly. Only unlike the stock market, a company can't choose to split their shares and create more or do any of that other stuff that they do to increase the supply. Like it's done. The only thing you will ever do with Bitcoin is lose more because people lose a wallet or something gets burned deliberately or whatever else you do, which basically increases the value of Bitcoin. So once you reach the maximum Bitcoin, which I think is like 2140 uh, is when we'll finally mine the last of it. Okay. Bitcoin's price will only increase in value, period. For the rest of, like, as a trend, not as a day to day. Okay. Um, so, well, it's it's. I mean, it's interesting. I, I just, I'm still skeptical, <laughs> to be honest. I I I remember in 2018, I did an interview with a a tech guy who had mm-hmm. written some stuff about Bitcoin, and uh, and he he had some pretty strong criticisms that I I can't remember off the top of my head at this point. Mm-hmm. And then like a lot of financial guys that I, you know, that I either knew or that I trusted in some way, they were often like very critical of Bitcoin as well. So it looks like my videos. Yeah, there we go. (laughs) (laughs) So, so I, so I'm, I'm hearing what you're saying, but I, I still feel like pretty skeptical like i'm still <laughs> well sure no i don't i i don't blame you and everybody should absolutely be skeptical when coming into anything that's going to be something you put your own hard earned money into well, right well I, I i can guarantee you i will never have enough money to put any money <laughs> but, into anything but so. there's well so this is something that you said too that i kind of wanted to ask you what you meant when you said that it's something for rich people right what right. did you mean by that well cuz it seems like the people who uh it's always the people who get in early that can afford to buy a bunch of these random crypto coins and, uh, and then they sell them off to, uh, to whoever will buy them. And then, uh, they, uh, and then they disappear, you know, and then they just take like, it's like a pump and dump, right? Like you, you, you're the first investor. You, so you get sure. all your money out of it. Uh, I guess we have a question from the chat. Oh, if you don't mind, we will. No. Uh, why won't federal governments mandate ledger access for taxation? As in make people, make the government have access to your ledger in order to have taxes paid on your crypto? Is that how I read that question? I think so. So at least in the US, I won't say that they've mandated ledger access, but you are required to basically pay taxes through filling out forms and any crypto exchange that's registered in the United States is required by law to report your earnings and trades to the government. Uh, So to me, that's about as far as you can go with any government without overreach, right? Mm -hmm. I don't want, I wouldn't want the bank account to have direct access to my checking account whenever they wanted either. Uh, Don't get me wrong. They could probably uh, do that, but many, we we know know many don't. don't. Yeah. 
So there are many that don't, but I would argue that probably the vast majority, I can't say all because I don't know all of them, but the vast majority of them are probably not based and registered in the United States. Um, so, Yeah. So I guess back to my initial, my, this is a thing that works for the rich. It's, it remind because it's so, it seems so, uh, adopted by all these, uh, various, uh, banking apps and whatnot, like same, like wealth simple or what have you, the stock, mm -hmm. the stock trading apps. Like it seems very like the same as stocks to me. Like this serves people wh who have money and doesn't serve people who don't. Well, there's two differences there. One, you'd be correct if your sole intent of getting into crypto is just to flip it rather quickly and make a bunch of money off of it. Sure. Uh, but there's no minimum amount like stock required to buy with a stock unless you're putting into like a mutual fund or something like that, a stock has a price and you buy one stock and that's the price. Bitcoin, one coin does have a price, but that coin is divisible by like a hundred million, right? So right now, the smallest entity that you can buy of a Bitcoin is less than one cent by several magnitudes of order. Mm. So like you can put $5 every week into Bitcoin and get $5 worth of Bitcoin and get a decimal point. How is that? So there's no, how is that different than say splitting stocks? Because the value of a stock, you're not increasing the number of Bitcoins. It, think of it like a dollar. A dollar is also 100 pennies, right? You can right. split that dollar into 100 pennies, but it's still a dollar. You haven't increased the supply of money. So You've is, increased the physical aspect of things, but... So is there a, a limit to how many, how many times you can divide a, a Bitcoin, say? So it's called a Satoshi, and I, I, I want to say it's one one millionth of a Bitcoin. Okay. So in... in uh, in a sense, actually, it's one one hundred million. Okay. So, if Bitcoin ever got to be worth a hundred million dollars per Bitcoin, the lowest amount you could buy would be one cent. Okay, that's eh, interesting. So, is that a problem? Maybe in five hundred years from now, I don't know. But it's not a problem in our lifetime or our kids' lifetime. Yeah, like I guess part of the problem I find with like crypto in general is that like uh, like maybe Bitcoin is a stable coin. But it's not a stable coin, but I'll let you go with where you're going. <laughs> yeah, it's quote unquote stable. <laughs> but well, I say that because there are things called stable right, coins yeah, that are pegged I, to a dollar, yeah. which is something completely different. But yeah, but uh, so but how can like, I guess it just seems like there's a lot of like real room for like people to be taken advantage of out there. I mean, there is with the dollar. Oh right? yeah, yeah. Ponzi schemes didn't start with crypto coins. They started with with companies and and dollars. And essentially, it's anything where you're taking somebody's money as an investment to pay off previous investors until you can't anymore, and then you run away with your with whatever you've made. Right? That's an aspect of human beings that has nothing to do with cryptocurrency. Like I don't know, it's in the news a lot, and like we talked about, it's not regulated, so there's more uh, availability for people to act dishonestly. But if you put even a fraction of the regulation in for cryptocurrency that we have for like, you know, companies and stocks and fiat currency and all that other stuff, you get rid of a lot of that. Um, so yeah, then I'm all you have to do is make sure that whatever <laughs> company you're working with has the stamp of approval of being registered with, you know, the country that you live in, or at least the country that you trust the most for whatever that means. Right. Uh, <laughs> yeah. And then you, they, it doesn't mean that something isn't going to happen, but it means that you're protected if it does. Right. Okay. In the same way that FDIC insures banks or at least big banks. I guess part of me is like i'm still i'm trying to be as fair to crypto as i can considering like i think money's fake and i hate capitalism and, <laughs> and that's where my initial comment came in that some of your ideas on fiat currency will absolutely influence this but the, everything that i'm hearing isn't a problem with blockchain or cryptocurrency as a thing it's a mm. problem with certain people and what they've chosen to do with it right right and all I'm saying is that exists everywhere and yeah. everything and anything unregulated has it more than things that are. I, I'm not a big fan of regulation, I, but I believe in light regulation, right? Okay. Yeah. I, I think you've made the case fairly well. <laughs> I would also state too that the end goal would be that we no longer compare Bitcoin to its USD value. Bitcoin is just it's like how often do people who are using some other foreign currency in their day-to-day -day lives, compare that to how much it's worth in the U.S. dollar, right? They don't. 
not in their everyday usage of that of that mm. currency. So that would be the end goal. Eventually, Bitcoin is just a currency that people use to make transactions and pay. And there isn't an incentive to convert it to US dollars unless you need US dollars for something or you're in the fringe area of finance that makes money off of trading between currencies, which also exists in the fiat world. I guess, uh, I guess kind of like, uh, how does this, how does this translate into the real world? Can you buy shit actually with crypto coins? I, uh, I can pay my power bill in Bitcoin. Okay. So there you go. I don't know I if mean, I can. Over the, uh, <laughs> over, I would say over the last year, we've lost some usability, but in like the two or three years before that, the amount of industry and even government entities, at least in the U S who have accepted Bitcoin and, and some other select, uh, Cryptocurrency has multiplied like crazy. Mm. Like I, I, I can't even like you could buy basketball tickets with uh Dodge with Dogecoin and and Bitcoin at certain places. Like it's picking up, and part of that was because of banking systems, traditional banking systems like uh, um, Signature and what was the other one uh, Silvergate creating essentially a new method of banking where it's instantaneous transfers to transfer fiat to cryptocurrency back and forth. But those two banks no longer exist. Mm -hmm. uh, so I know we're probably getting close on time here, but that is an entire conversation on right, its own right. about what happened with the banks. And I'll, I'll summarize it this way. There's basically five banks in trouble over the course of a week. The first one was almost completely crypto related as far as their business. But what caused them to fail was stuff that could cause any small uh, bank to fail. Right. Uh, the next one had very little to do with cryptocurrency, except for a couple of its customers or is primarily, uh, uh, what do you call them? Like investors, tech investors and stuff like that. Okay. Um, and they failed again for a thing that could fail with any bank. And then you had the third bank that failed that didn't fail. The government shut it down under systemic risk. Mm. But by the time they went in to shut it down, they were doing fine. So a legally operating bank with only 25% of its customers being crypto related was shut down by the government and then sold off. And who bought it, whether you want to say they weren't allowed or they just didn't, they didn't buy any of the crypto aspects of that bank. Okay. And then there's lastly two more banks, one in the US and one not, that were struggling just as much as those first two but had zero to do with crypto in any way, shape, or form. And those banks were bailed out, both by big banks like uh, Chase and Wells Fargo and oh, okay. government funds. They were not allowed to fail. So yeah. if you start Googling a, a thing, like I said, I'm not in conspiracies, but there's something called Choke Point 2.0 that's, a, I think, a very real thing. And even one of the, um, one of the executives uh, for Signature that shut down um, I think his name was, what was that about right here? Uh, Barney Frank, right? Okay. So he's a former democratic representative in the house from yeah, Massachusetts. I think I've heard of that name before. And a chair, he was a chairman of the house financial services committee. And he went on record on CNBC and said signature was shut down as a message from the government, uh, for banks to not do business with crypto. Hmm. So this is a guy who's got a very long history in the government, working the financial system who left and then became involved in Signature saying this. Right. Uh, and when you look at everything that's going on, it's really hard to deny. So other countries, right, just to, as a kind of a last nod to this, uh, the UK has put out a lot of, of regulational framework for cryptocurrencies to work in. Uh, I think it was Taiwan or Hong Kong, okay. one of the two. They are pushing a bill to basically, if you're a new crypto uh, firm and you want to sell your coin, your initial coin offering to garner money for capital, you can do it tax free in their country. Mm -hmm. So in the United States, who's supposed to be this leader of technological advancement, we're suing people in this industry uh, for breaking laws that don't exist and also refusing to make those laws. Whereas these other countries are being welcoming and even offering tax free opportunities. So what do you think the result is going to be? I mean, these countries aren't going to stay in the United States, which really sucks long term, not only for technology in general, but as a U.S. citizen or even a Canadian citizen, if they're if they do something similar, right. if those entities aren't home based in your country, your control over them is next to nothing. Right. Yeah. And if they do do something wrong, unless you can get an extradition from that country, everybody's screwed. So it hurts everybody. Yeah, uh, definitely. Uh, yeah, I mean. Government fails on a lot of ways. <laughs> it does. It does. <laughs> I guess uh, 
let's quickly go through your foes and comrades. I appreciate uh, the insight into crypto. Uh, I think you made a, a pretty good case uh, for, uh, but but haven't convinced me to be any less skeptical of it than I am. <laughs> so let me just ask this question: <laughs> Can you at least acknowledge that you are? you are critical of the people utilizing it, maybe not necessarily the technology itself. Yeah, no, I think that's probably fair. Yeah. Okay, then I'm happy. <laughs> <laughs> right. All right, so for foes and comrades, you've got uh, your first foe is, uh, well, I guess your foes are the SEC and Gary Gensler, and then politicians who politicize science. Yes. So I, I feel like the first part of that is easy to just wrap up. That They are responsible for everything I was just complaining about in the United <laughs> States with regards to cryptocurrency right. and very, very directly and deliberately. And I just, that has to stop for the betterment of everybody. So uh, I would recommend people go read into what's going on there if they're curious. And then the, the, other, the other side of what you're saying is part of my basically my pet peeves throughout all of everything is at least in this country and probably in other ones, we've, we've gotten to this point where we're really politicizing science, things oh, yeah. like climate change or, you know, whatever the case may be to where we're no longer listening to experts, you know, like with COVID, right. we're listening to politicians or even government sanctioned people, no matter what side they're on, instead of listening to the actual experts in these fields. Uh, and so that's a huge problem for me. Yeah, I think, I mean, in a sense, that's kind of been the, the case for climate change for a very long time, right? It has. Like, yep. we used to joke about how uh, in order to have, like, because uh, the media or whatever would always put one side against the other. And it's like the scientist, the climate change scientist, and the the pundit who disagrees. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, and I've always said the most damage ever done to the climate change whole and push whatever you want to call it was actually an inconvenient truth by Al Gore. Right. Who was yeah. pro pushing yeah. climate change yeah. because of the exaggerations and some bold faced lies that were told in that. Yeah. And everybody, when that, when that stuff that you're claiming doesn't come to fruition, everybody looks at it and thinks the entire thing is just BS. So they've undermined the entire work being done. Well, you know, and, and uh, I mean, the one thing that I remember from being a climate change denier was that uh, it was pretty hard to believe in Al Gore fighting for the climate when he was flying around on private jets all over the place <laughs> doing talks. Yep. Like, yep, you're not wrong. Like, I, I don't want to, you know, I don't want to give climate change denial a pass because it's mm -hmm. pretty, it is actually pretty dire in the, like, <laughs> like sure. as things go. But, uh, but also like, yeah, like it, it's. If you can disprove a claim made by the other side, then it gives legitimacy to your idea that the entire thing is is wrong. Right, exactly. And that's what and that's what we're doing when we politicize this stuff. You can't let people who don't know what the hell they're talking about talk about it. <laughs> yep. Yep. But also it's it's hard not to politicize, like for things to not be political, right? Like mm -hmm. like again with climate change, like that that has major, major policy implications. And that's where politicians lie, right? I, I I agree in some extent, but I also don't agree because if you look back, let's say you remember acid rain and the hole in the ozone, right? True. Where's that at? Where's that at? I, it's I nowhere think we defeated it with we, climate change. <laughs> we we legitimately we passed the policies we needed to decrease the CFCs in the atmosphere yeah. and fixed it because we listened to experts and we didn't politicize it. <laughs> yeah, so it's yeah. possible. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's fair. I guess it, it's tough because once you get into a certain money, at, like passing regulation, that's a political thing. And then you mm -hmm. get lobbyists involved who yep. who don't like it. So because it will sure. affect their profit margins and what have you. So, yeah, I mean, yeah. Just to kind of throw this out there, they're always just kind of like – so one of the biggest things with like climate denialists and other things is they talk about like paid uh, scientists, paying scientists off to say this, right? <laughs> right? But what I don't understand is the scientists they're talking about make up the vast majority of scientists in that field. But mm -hmm. if you look historically, we have uh, nicotine and the tobacco industry. We have uh, leaded fuel with the fuel industry. Yep. We have sugar. 
and if you look at all those events, you see that those industries did legitimately pay off a very small amount of supposed experts to cause distrust of what the majority of people were saying in that field. Yeah. How do you not see this? <laughs> yep. no, exactly. <laughs> like, how, how are you seeing this history? And you think that the majority of scientists in different countries who don't even necessarily get along or have access to each other are somehow all being paid off and who's paying them off? Yeah. And why? Yeah, big, big environmental movements. <laughs> yeah, what are they getting out of it? I know why the tobacco industry was paying off scientists. They had a lot of money riding on that. I know why sugar, I know why the fuel, like I know why they were paying people off. Yeah. Why are we paying people? Where's the money at? Yeah, that's right. And why? Because it's costing people more money to do this than it is anything else. That's right, yeah. Yeah, like, well, what's his, Michael Mann, I think, with his mm -hmm. hockey stick graph uh, or what have you. Yeah. I don't think that his... Life is like, I don't think he's like a, a millionaire traveling around the world because he wrote <laughs> if that book. anything, his life is probably worse yeah. now after that, right? Yeah. Like uh, just because of how people are and how they react to things and how the internet works and mob, quote unquote, justice, right? <laughs> like we, we live in a society where people are harassing like the parents of victims of mass shootings yeah. to the point where they have to hide. Yeah. Like that's the world we live in. So what what gain is there? <laughs> yeah, exactly. None. Absolutely none. <laughs> <laughs> there's there's no glory on the side of facts and truth. <laughs> no, there, and is, justice. there really isn't. <laughs> just, at least at least right now. Um, okay, so uh, that's that's our enemies or our our foes. Who uh, for comrades? You have uh, Adam Grant and his work life podcast. Yeah, so this is something that I've actually came across just this past year. I don't know him, uh, okay. but I just was randomly looking for podcasts and came across it. And basically, he's a workplace psychologist, I think. Is okay. what he basically studies what it, what it is to be in the workplace and how things affect quality of work, uh, all that kind of stuff. Okay. And he's done a lot of stuff even before the pandemic that is just like foundationally groundbreaking. And he doesn't just talk about it on paper. He goes and he talks to companies who are actively doing it. Okay. And one thing that I do like is he does have advertisers, but he hand selects his advertisers out of people who are doing weird things. Mm. And he, his advertisement is going into their place and talking to them about what they're doing. And then at the end of it, it's like, oh, buy this thing, right? At the very end. So it's kind of interesting. My favorite one was there's some tomato packing plant in California that has no bosses. Okay. Bosses got, are basically self-elected, <laughs> are, are kind of self-elected on a task by task basis for whatever is needed. And they police themselves and they're an extremely like uh, successful company, at least before COVID. I don't know where they're at now, right. uh, but you can't blame them <laughs> for if they go right. down for yeah, that. If COVID but uh, the only, the only person that you could point to, to actually say is a boss boss is the actual like owner, like okay. president, whatever you want to call him. So all they got to do is go that extra step and make it a co-op and you're good. Pretty much. <laughs> right. Like, and, and so the only thing he will do is step in when there's just disagreement that absolutely cannot be solved on the ground level by people amongst themselves. And it's been working great for decades. So that's just one example of stuff that he talks about. So I highly recommend looking at that, just all aspects of, of work life, whether it's talking about, you know, uh, different issues that you have, more vacation time, less vacation time, teleworking is obviously a big thing uh, right now. They talk about that. So, um, yeah, so that's what I'd like to, to shout out just because I think it's of high benefit to anybody who would listen. Yeah, cool. I'll, I'll definitely check that out. The, when you said he was a, like, a, a, psych, a work psychologist, like, um, uh, my my first thing is uh, made me think of like when I'm at work I I try to like I'm a pretty chilled guy I'm I'm mm -hmm. you know I'm a pretty I I'll do my job without complaining pretty much all the time as long as I'm given the tools I need to do my job right <laughs> yep. yep but so and I, a lot of people a lot of people I feel like are that way too. Yeah. But there's things that happen that you can do that improve that like we don't we just as a society and as a species, we just start taking however things are as the way that they are. And we we tend not to usually fight against that. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But there are systemic things that are less good than <laughs> they could be. And so he yep. talks a lot about those. Nice. That's awesome. So I guess the only thing left is uh, where can people find you and your content? 
Oh, yeah. So you can go to dashofscience.com to get to my website. It's also my personal website. It's got all the other kind of projects and stuff that I play around with. Um, and so you can find that podcast pretty much anywhere that there's podcasts. Uh, like I said, I took a little bit of a hiatus, but uh, I've already got episodes ready to come out now. So they'll be picking up again. You can Very also cool. find me on Twitter at Physicist Chris. Uh, which I am off and on since the great takeover. I haven't decided if I want to be there yet or not, but you know, <laughs> yeah. if you catch me there, you'll catch me there. Uh, and then I think those are the two primary places. Uh, you can also look at Dash Science on Facebook, and I am on twitch.tv at Physicist Chris as well. Uh, but I just switched finally to a new internet provider that will actually allow me to stream again. Ah. Uh, so I'll, I'll definitely be back on there again soon as well. Very cool. Well, thank you so much for your time. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for having me. I, I very much enjoyed it. All right. That's all, folks. Thanks for watching and or listening. Remember to share this show with your friends or on the social media site that you use the most. Thank you to everyone who supports this show on Patreon. I really appreciate it. And it helps me survive, which is essentially the only way that projects like this can continue for me. If you want to contribute, you can do that at uh, patreon.com slash skeptical leftist, or you can buy me a coffee at Buy Me a Coffee dot com slash skeptical left if you can't contribute financially then a, a like on youtube or a five-star rating and a review on apple podcasts or on one of the podcast review sites like podchaser would be great if you want to find more from me then make sure to check the show notes for links to all my stuff and to check out my website skepticalleftist.com there you can find the videos I do with my friend Damien Marie Athope and all my old content from the Brainstorm podcast, Skeptarchy, and from my newly retired show, From, Ma from Many People's Strength. You can also find links to my Discord, Reddit, and Twitch. You can contact me through my website or by emailing mindofaskepticalleftist at gmail.com. My Twitter is at Skeptical Lefty. My Facebook page is The Mind of a Skeptical Leftist. And my Mastodon is collectiva.social slash at Skeptical Leftist. Thanks so much for listening and or watching and make sure to leave a comment on the video or on my website. Uh, join your local org, print off some posters or pamphlets and uh, spread the propaganda.